Christmas Eve, 1868. A Texas saloon hums with subdued holiday cheer. Stinking of whiskey and smoke, the rough and tumble cowboys keep one eye on the cards and the other on their guns. After all, DeWitt County is a dangerous place. And no one knows that better than Buck Taylor. When he and cousin Dick Chisholm walk through the door, they are ready for trouble. They spot an unwelcome face in the crowd. Billy Sutton, a young deputy with a special hatred for the Taylors. The cousins are not about to break bread next to a mortal enemy. And so they proceed to come in and tell him that they want him out of DeWitt County by dark. And Billy comes back and says, well, if you're looking to start something, why not wait till sundown? Sutton and his men rise up. Both sides caress their holsters, waiting for the other to flinch. But Billy's hand is steadier his brow less beaded with sweat. The gunslingers draw and fire. When the smoke clears, Buck Taylor is dead, his cousin Dick wounded. As he staggers toward the door, they follow him and proceed to shoot him dead right there on the steps of the bar. And these two cousins were, were dead. And what a terrible time, Christmas Eve, for them to die. The Christmas Eve killings initiate a nine-year feud, the bloodiest in Texas history. It was just a powder keg with a very rapidly burning fuse. In fact, the fuse is lit two years earlier. In 1866, Texas is hell on earth for returning Confederate soldiers. After losing the Civil War, they limp home to find a humiliated, bankrupt state ruled by Yankee overlords. These men were beaten, they were discouraged, they had no money, they hadn't been paid in years, and are coming back to a Texas that's devastated. And adding insult to injury, the Union has sent black soldiers to police the locals. The fact that the soldiers that were doing the occupation were Negro just kind of like uh, fueled all kinds of racial problems in the state. Well, you know, one year they're slaves and the next year they're masters. And I think that's probably difficult for, would be for anybody. The army felt that there was nothing wrong with uh, pushing the black slaves and letting them be the masters for a while. This was another way of rubbing the southerner or the Texans nose in it. The Taylors are a well-respected cattle family. But like many of their neighbors, they resent the new law. Taylors have been in Texas since the 1820s, when they fought to win its independence from Mexico. The fact that they had made Texas an Anglo dominion carried over into the later period. The Klan settles in DeWitt County, 100 miles south of Houston. DeWitt's terrain is rugged and uneven, just like many of its people. You had to be tough to live here. You had to be, have a lot of grit for one thing, and you had to stand up for what you want. These were families that hung together. Families in those days, uh, if they didn't have anything else, they had at least each other. And the Taylors were in this sense were no different than anyone else. Their source of income is no different either. Like many cattle rustlers, the tailors round up mavericks, stray cattle with no brands on their hides. I think you have to take into consideration the cattle industry and the open range. 
And I think probably some of the problems came from branding someone else's doggies. The Taylors had this catch-as-catch-can attitude. In other words, it's wild, it's ownerless, it's up for grabs. If we don't get it, somebody else will. Well, this got them into trouble, and it eventually led to the feud. In 1866, Buck Taylor, a tough second-generation rustler, is wanted for a minor scuffle with a Union man. Black soldiers arrive to question him, but he isn't interested in conversation. Buck shoots and kills a sergeant and makes a narrow escape. I think all the Taylors were gentlemen. Even gentlemen are upset if they are pushed or put upon or trod upon. And I think the Taylors were tough people. I think they still are. And if someone wronged them, they were going to retaliate in some way. They weren't just going to sit still for it. It isn't long before another Taylor gentleman runs afoul of the law. There was an incident in a bar room to where several uh, black soldiers had the audacity to come up to the bar and demand whiskey. And uh, uh, an argument resulted when, of course, the whites said, step aside, I'm not in the habit of drinking with Negroes. One of those whites is Hayes Taylor, who settles the argument with his favorite negotiating tool. Like Buck, he escapes. But this time, the shots reach the ears of Union generals, who see the killing as evidence that Texas is dangerously rebellious. The Taylors and the law quickly become enemies. A year later, Hayes Taylor has a heated argument with a Union soldier while his brother, Doughboy, looks on. The soldier calls Hayes a liar and pulls his hat over his ears. Well, uh, then it's now you don't mess with a Texan's hat. Hayes immediately pulls out a bowie knife to this guy's throat and says, I'll give, you, I'll give you a chance to take those words back. Another soldier, Major Thompson, orders the Taylor boys to drop their weapons. Major Thompson comes running up, demands to know what's happening. It isn't but a few minutes before Major Thompson is lying there beside him and the Taylors are on the run. Both soldiers are killed in the confusion. Now, with four Union men dead, the Taylors are public enemy number one. So the military uh, based in San Antonio decided to make the Taylors an example. They turned to a young crack shot named Billy Sutton to lay down the law. Like the Taylors, Sutton is a mavericker. But he is willing to cooperate with the Yankees, perhaps to protect his own profits. Billy Sutton's occupation was a cattleman. And as such, he, uh, he also had a stake in those cattle that were branded by someone else and driven north. He, uh, he sees the Taylors as being part of this force that's branding the wrong calves. Sutton is also a well-respected figure in DeWitt County. People who knew him described him as soft-spoken, well-meaning, pleasant individual. At least originally, he was uh, what one would call a nice guy. But this nice guy quickly hardens into a cold-blooded killer. Whether he was an angel or not, he seems to have been somebody that just couldn't escape the feud. And so the sides are chosen. Sutton versus Taylor. Billy Sutton is backed by a group known as the Regulators. Texas is a very lawless state. And in order to control the lawlessness, 
The government brings together the regulators, and the regulators are composed of individuals sometimes who join, sometimes who are simply said, hey, you're a part of the regulators. The Sutton-Taylor feud has an intensity that will cross bloodlines. Ironically, one of the chief regulators is a Taylor by marriage, Joe Tumlinson. Oh, oh, Joe must have been quite a character. From this good day, it's discussed why Joe was on the side of the Sutton faction rather than with the Taylors. We frankly can't figure it out. When members of the same family start firing away at each other, then you've got to ask yourself why. Some speculate that Tumlinson also grows tired of competing with the Taylors for mavericking profits and plans to kill off the competition, even if that means murdering his own kin. Others believe it is just a matter of backing the right horse. You can't go against the government, you can't go against the army and expect to come out ahead. So Tumlinson knew which side he ultimately had to belong to, otherwise he was going to wind up a loser. It is Billy Sutton's new law against the Taylor's old guard in DeWitt County. Sutton and his regulators are about to wage war on a single family and get more than they bargained for. As the morning sun spills over the dusty Texas plains, brothers Hayes and Doughboy Taylor hike home. Wanted for the murder of Union officers, they have been sleeping on the range to avoid capture for months. But the law has been waiting for them. And today, Joe Tumlinson, Billy Sutton, and the regulators have a new weapon a ruthless war veteran named Jack Helm. When the regulators uh, needed a, a hard, tough, mean individual in order to become a leader, they naturally reached out and touched on Jack Helm. The Texas governor has appointed Helm to rid the state of outlaws once and for all, especially the notorious Taylors. Captain Jack Helm is a, one of your all-time sleazy guys. A body count was, that was in his department. He wanted a body count to show people that he was earning his paycheck. He was perceived as a hothead. He always ended up getting shot at for some reason or shooting somebody. So he must not have been a very uh, agreeable person. With Helm, the regulators keep killing bandits in their quest to restore order. There just seemed to be an era of vigilanteism in the time. People didn't want to waste time with the courts. These are the kind of people that none of us really would have liked to have been friends with, and none of us certainly uh, would have wanted to have been around any of these individuals who were armed. And their power grows when Jack is appointed head of the newly formed state police. Now the full force of the law is behind them. These guys, they can send a posse to your house in the dead of night, shoot the place full of holes, you know, women, children, whoever. And the law says that they're entitled to do it. Now, boys, we can kick ass and take names, and it's all legal. That was their attitude. With this new license to kill, Helm decides to ambush Hayes and Doughboy at their home. He holds their family hostage and waits for the boys to arrive. Suddenly, the regulators appear out of nowhere. Doughboy takes a slug in the shoulder. And he scrambles through a corn patch and makes his escape. Hayes, on the other hand, sees his father being held on the front porch. Determined to rescue his father, Hayes charges the house. But there are too many regulators, and his rescue effort ends in death. Now the tally is three Taylor boys and four Union men dead. 
Their death stoked the fire of the feud, and things only get worse. The regulators begin to arrest Taylors on trumped up charges, a ruthless but convenient tactic. Oh, this happened many, many times. Oh, we're sorry the prisoner tried to escape. And the local authorities just seemed to accept it. It was not called murder, but it was. It happens again and again. But when it happens to Taylor relatives William and Henry Kelly, there is hell to pay. One day, Helm, Sutton, and the regulators arrest the boys on an old public disturbance charge. They insist it's only a trivial matter and that there's no cause for concern. But given the regulators' reputation for murder, Henry's wife Amanda grows worried as her husband is led away. Amanda jumps out and decides to run after them. She gets up to the top of the hill and there they are, down in a little cluster below. And one of the boys is off on the ground filling his pipe. He reaches down, strikes a match on the bottom of his boot, and as he's bent over, Billy Sutton shot him in the back of the head. Both brothers are murdered in cold blood. Amanda sees this and starts screaming bloody murder. The posse men don't mind shooting the men. In fact, they probably take great delight in it, but they're not going to shoot a woman. The regulators flee, but they won't get off so easy this time. That kind of story got around the county pretty fast. So pretty soon the regulators got a very bad reputation for shooting people in the back. The slang of the Kelly boys struck a chord. Suddenly you had something there that everybody in Texas could identify with. And suddenly you also had the people of Texas recognizing that these regulators were no better than the men they were killing. And as a result, Jack Helm is dismissed from the regulators. But even with Helm out of the picture, the regulators are a force to be reckoned with. When Helms is forced out by the state of Texas, what had been the Helms-Taylor feud now becomes the Sutton-Taylor feud, primarily because Billy Sutton becomes the, the strong right arm of the faction that is still pursuing the Taylors. As a cattleman, Billy Sutton's livelihood is threatened by the Taylors' widespread mavericking. As a lawman, he is a target. But his first order of business is a loudmouth troublemaker. Pitkin Taylor, a relative of the Kelly boys, who is still raising hell about the murders. So finally the Sutton uh, group decided to shut him up. And they crept up on the house one night, saw an old ox out there, and uh, had a cowbell on it. And they said, ring that cowbell. And Pitkin, hearing the cowbell, assumes that uh, his cattle are getting into his corn. So when he got up to go out, and shoo the cows back, he found out the cowbells were not on cows, but they were on the side of the Suttons, and he was shot. The regulators even deny the old man a peaceful burial. They show up at his funeral and make a mockery of the service. They were drunk and hooting and hollering and yelling at the time the old man was being put under. I'm sure that the Suttons were there rejoicing because they had killed another tailor. There would be no reason that they wouldn't do that. Bloodthirsty times that it was that they were rejoicing. If I had been a tailor at that funeral, 
I would have resolved that just as soon as my dad is buried, I'm going to get my gun and there's going to be a few Sutton funerals taking place within a very near future. A young Taylor widow tries to express her grief in a letter to her family. It does seem to me like the Lord has been unjust on all of us. But for what, I don't know. It don't seem to be that any of us have ever done anything mean enough to be punished in the way that we have. Though everything looks dark and gloomy now, perhaps there's a bright future for all of us yet. I really don't think there's any way to understand why the Taylors apparently were singled out um, for the ruthless treatment that they were given. It's a question that's been pondered by the generation since then. I don't think there's ever been an answer to it. We don't know why. But during the funeral, the why of Pitkin Taylor's murder is less important than hunting down who is responsible. His sons, there at his graveside, are swearing uh, vengeance. Don't cry, Ma. <laughs> I'm going to wash my hands in Billy Sutton's blood. As a young Jim Taylor pays his last respects to his slain father, his blood is boiling. Jim vows to get even with every one of his enemies, or die trying. If you think the Taylors were vengeful before the funeral, during the funeral and after the funeral, they had only one thought on their mind, and that was revenge. Billy Sutton had to die. Indeed, the next time gunfire rings out, it will be a Taylor pulling the trigger. After four funerals, the Taylors have nothing but vengeance on their minds. They track their first target to an old saloon. Inside, Billy Sutton is one of a few lonely customers passing the time with a cold beer and a game of solitaire. Outside, a pair of young hands trembles with a mix of hate and fear. Jim Taylor carries a shotgun and the burden of avenging his father's death. The humiliation of his funeral is only weeks old and it has forced Jim to grow up before his time. And I do think that after the death of Pitkin, that Jim Taylor became, if you want to say, a leader of the Taylor gang. Jim doesn't make a sound as he sticks the barrel through the doors, only a few feet from his unsuspecting target. He has spent the better part of the day following Sutton, waiting for the moment to strike. Now he sets Billy in his sights, squeezes the trigger, and misses. Jim barely escapes when Billy chases after his would-be assassin. For Sutton, what began as a mission to restore law has become intensely personal, and the young gunslinger is finding it harder to keep death from his doorstep. Even these individuals who are involved in all these the shootings and the killings and, and whatever, have uh, they have a conscience and they grow weary of these things and they want to see it end. Things only get worse when the Texas State Legislature abolishes the state police in 1873. For Sutton and the regulators, it is the equivalent of having their wings clipped. They don't have the uh, shield, as it were, anymore of higher authority. And needless to say, a vengeance came. Might have taken it a while, but sooner or later these people all became targets. At first, Taylor vengeance comes by way of blind luck. 
Soon after his failed attempt on Sutton's life, Jim Taylor visits another county on business. Joining him is a young gunslinger named John Wesley Harden. John Wesley Harden isn't uh, related to the Taylors. He is simply tied to them by, uh, by bonds of friendship and, and this sort of thing. And he kind of likes them. They're rough and they're rowdy. In many respects, they're nasty. They're a lot like John Wesley Harden. But Harden is more than just rough or nasty. He is considered one of the deadliest men in Texas. I don't know how many people it killed. I don't know if anybody knows how many people it killed, but apparently he did kill a number and was very proud of it. And as fate would have it, Hardin would earn another trophy that day. The pair stops at a blacksmith along the way. And who do they see there at the blacksmith shop but, but Jack Helm, their old enemy. Taylor and Hardin cannot believe their luck. Helm has not even bothered to wear his gun belt. And in real gunfighting, it frankly doesn't make any difference if you're armed or not. In fact, your assailants generally can be brave men, but they still prefer that you be unarmed. And John Wesley Harden tells him to throw up his hands. Well, Helm realizes he's not packing his pistol. All he's got is a knife in his boots, so he pulls his knife out to defend himself. But a knife is no match for Hardin's shotgun. A single blast sends Helm to the ground with a hole in his belly. Jim comes in and finishes Helm off, naming all of the relatives, including his father, that Helm is responsible for the death of. And when Joe Tomlinson got word of this, he knew that he was next. There was a period in there of a few weeks or months where I think that the Taylors were trying to put an end to everything by taking out as many of the Tumlinsons and Suttons as they could. And they went after uh, Joe Tumlinson at his house. Tumlinson isn't about to sit idly and wait for his assassins. He gathers his friends together and turns his ranch into a fortress. And sure enough, a group of Taylors arrives shortly thereafter. But instead of the hit and run they are hoping for, Tomlinson's preparation forces a 36-hour siege. As day slips into night, both sides stare down the barrels of their rifles, knowing that one itchy trigger finger could unleash a firestorm. But this time, cooler heads prevail. By then we had town marshals, and they talked to both sides and got them to come into town and lay down their guns. After seven years of feuding, both battle-weary factions agree to a peace treaty on August 12th, 1873. And everybody's uh, quite pleased that they're going to get some sleep for a change. The treaty is signed by members of the Sutton and Taylor factions. And then they had it published in the local newspaper. And they felt like by doing this, it would shame them into stopping. Everybody who is anybody in terms of the Suttons and the Taylors are listed there. And over a period of time, within the next few years, most of them will be gone. It's always amazed me when I read these kinds of words that people produce these on the spot. I don't know whether they walked around with examples of peace treaties in their pockets or what, but it's just fascinating to me that they produce these sorts of documents, uh, it seems, out of thin air. Spelled out in black and white, the parties make a solemn vow. We each for himself here promise on honor to abstain from all hostile acts or demonstration calculated to create a breach of peace or to induce anyone to suppose that any violence is intended. The feud was over. They would no longer shoot at each other. Well, at least that's what it was on the paper. Didn't seem to help, did it? In fact, the treaty's ink will barely have time to dry before the fragile peace is shattered and the blood begins to spill again. December, 1873. 
With a four-month-old peace treaty in place, a Taylor sympathizer is in a cheery holiday mood. This will be the first quiet Christmas in seven years of feuding. A Sutton sympathizer is also out for a walk, but he is not full of glad tidings. The Taylor sympathizer strolls right into a clever trap and his blood spills onto the streets. The score for Jack Helm's assassination is finally settled. And once again, the Sutton-Taylor feud rears its ugly head. For Billy Sutton, enough is enough. He has a new wife and a baby on the way. And with one attempt on his life already, his priorities have shifted. And he wanted to go somewhere and set up a new life and become a family man. They had to be tired after all of these years of fighting. He leaves because the frying pan has become a little too hot to handle. His wife is pregnant. She's uh, saying, well, let's just leave Texas at least until the baby comes. Uh, meanwhile, people are passing information back to the Taylors. And it was only a question of time before the Taylors caught up with him. He couldn't be lucky forever. On March 11th, 1874, Sutton, his wife, and a friend arrive in the port town of Indianola with everything they can carry. Tickets in hand, they rendezvous with the steamer Clinton for the journey to New Orleans. What happens next is debated to this day. When Billy was shot down in Indianola, it wasn't a surprise attack. It was a surprise attack. Billy Sutton never saw it coming. Sutton and his companions are on the docks moments before departure. As the passengers anxiously wait to board, two men make their way through the crowd toward the steamer. The uh, Taylor boys manage to be there at the same time, and they go down, of course, uh, to where passengers are loading. This is where the two stories differ. One says that Billy and family friend Gabe Slaughter are gunned down without ever knowing what hit them. The other version places Billy, his wife, and Gabe in the dining salon when the attackers arrive. And Gabe looks around and says, Billy, isn't that... Jim Taylor over there, and isn't that Bill Taylor with him? Shouldn't we get out our guns? And Billy said, no, there are too much men to do anything here now. This was just a fight between Billy and the Taylors. It didn't involve other people. And even though they would shoot each other in cold blood, unarmed or not, uh, they typically wouldn't do it in a setting that would hurt other people. So I think Billy was simply counting on that. He was certainly wrong, because uh, the Taylors came up, and one of them shot uh, Billy through the head and through the heart. And then the other one shot Gabe through the head, and they both fell together. There's poor Laura, uh, pregnant, hysterical, you know. Help! Somebody's just killing my husband. Whichever version rings true, Billy Sutton's murder seems an especially cruel twist of fate. He was just seconds, maybe minutes, maybe a couple of hours away from sailing away and resuming his life and his livelihood. And the irony is that at this particular moment, death struck him. His life was ended as a result of the feud, just as he was apparently trying to escape it. feud seems to be something like a black hole. Uh, I know even today it seems to be very difficult for people to completely stay away from this feud. 
the killing of Billy Sutton uh, was uh, regarded as uh, something that was going to shut this feud down. Of course, it didn't because old Joe Tomlinson was still alive and kicking. There's plenty of murder left in DeWitt County. The only question, who will escape and who won't? June, 1874. Billy Sutton is dead, unable to escape the wrath of young Jim Taylor. The feud has been raging for eight years, but there is more grief to go around. Three innocent Taylors are about to pay for a murder they did not commit like Sutton, they might have never seen it coming. The boys are arrested for theft by the remaining regulators and brought to the courthouse for trial. But Joe Tomlinson has a different sort of justice in mind. To even the score for uh, Billy's murder, uh, Joe Tomlinson got together a lynch mob and uh, took some of the young Taylor Taylor's out of jail and strung him up. Joe Tomlinson has his own date with death. He passes away from old age shortly after the lynching. He drew a lot of respect from both sides. He really did. He didn't get shot. So that says a lot for anybody that was involved in that feud. Joe was one of the few that managed to die in bed with his boots on. Uh, and after his death, the, uh, the, the feud wound down quickly. But not before adding one final chapter to its bloody legacy. Jim Taylor is still alive, and he has been on the run since his bold killing at Indianola. Jim, meanwhile, is homesick. He wants to go back down to the feud. So, on December 27, 1875, he returns to DeWitt County to attend a Christmas celebration. The fugitive clutches his gun firmly and walks cautiously. Evidently not cautiously enough, because as he's going down the street, the guns begin to pop. Billy's men have been waiting for the man that murdered their friend and leader. I guess that the Sutton faction, even without the leadership of Billy, still felt they needed to avenge Billy's death by killing Jim. Taylor is blasted to the ground the Sutton faction's final act of retribution. In the end, the young man who had been so full of hate and vengeance, who had sworn to rid the earth of his enemies, fell victim to the same guns that claimed his father. With Jim Taylor's blood, the last of the real Sutton Taylor feud spilled out onto the ground. The era of outlaws and vigilante justice fades into legend at the end of the 19th century. The Sutton Taylor feud certainly has a great deal of excitement. It has suspense. It's got a lot of mystery in it. It was a time of great feuds and a time of great loves. The time of great hatreds. Time of strengths. But with the demise of the Sutton Taylor feud, things began to change in Texas. Law came to Texas. And it's exciting to talk about and it's interesting to write about, but it's a time in which we'll never see again. With Billy Sutton, Jim Taylor, Joe Tumlinson, and Jack Helm under the dirt, 
the feud finally grinds to a halt. Groups like the Regulators begin to disappear as Texas turns to more organized law enforcement. There's lots of feuds in Texas. <laughs> Much of the Sutton-Taylor feud uh, mentality still exists in Texas, and yet it's settled today by lawyers in a courtroom. Very rarely do we hear the sound of guns. In the 21st century, the great-great-grandchildren of these legendary figures have managed to find some common ground. Uh, I don't know that there are a lot of angels on, on either side of the camp here. There are no good guys or bad guys in this. They're only weird guys. So the kind of people, if we had to sleep near them, we would sleep with one eye open and one gun cocked. The Sutton-Taylor feud burned white hot between 1866 and 1875. And while the guns of the feud have been silent for over a hundred years, the spirit that drove it can still be found in southeast Texas. I know there are people uh, that are descendants of the Suttons that don't want to talk about this thing, that still get upset when people call them. And I know I have other distant cousins that uh, to this day have a difficult time talking about the Taylors with a kind word. As recently as five years ago, a Victoria reporter ran a column about one of the incidents in the Sutton Taylor feud and was getting threatening phone calls. So even to this day, there's a lot of animosity. They fought together in all the nation's wars since those days. Uh, so there's uh, quite a bit of brotherhood, but it's still some strong feelings on both sides of the feud as to who was right and who, who was, had justice on their side. Who knows, these people may start blowing each other away again. You know, emotions fade slowly, memories fade slowly, but I think it's going to be a long time before everyone puts this to bed. <laughs>